this session our agenda is going to discuss what 3d printing is we are going to discuss couple of manufacturing methods that are there and then we are going to compare those to 3d printing and define we are going to define what 3d printing is we are going to discuss what traditional manufacturing uh, has limitations and how 3d printing solve that what kind of advantages you will get with 3d printing we are not going to go uh, very deep into that we are just going to compare it in terms of cost and see how 3d printing has advantage over traditional manufacturing after that we are going to discuss different kind of 3d printing processes then at the end we are going to discuss different steps in a typical 3d printing process we are going to talk in general about steps in 3d printing process as it could it will be different from uh, different many different methods to different method but we will just go in generalized way so uh, let's see if anybody has any question if not then we can start it from here does not look like anybody has a question so i think we are going to start so uh, before we discuss what 3d printing is let's discuss typical manufacturing methods so one of the manufacturing method is formative manufacturing in which you have a raw material you melt the raw material then you pour that raw material into a mold uh, either directly or using some force to get your desired shape the example of this kind of methods are casting vacuum molding injection molding vacuum forming forming die casting etc this kind of methods are really good if you have a high volume production say if you want to make 10000 of some kind of casings then you will definitely go for injection molding because it's really cheap uh, i think mohammed has a question uh, let's see mm, okay it uh, has uh, the advantage of this formative manufacturing is it has really low cost per part when you have a high volume production but this is only true when you are making tens of thousand of pieces if you don't want that many pieces or if you're on your early design steps and you just want to make couple of pieces or if you are just prototyping any concept then your formatting manufacturing is not a good option since the tool cost is really high which is my next point which is high investment in tooling you need to have a specialized skill set to make the tools for injection molding or for casting which is not always easy which is time consuming which is uh, money consuming which needs a lot of money there is really low material waste in this processes which is really good you uh, most of the time you end up with really low material waste or almost no material waste and whatever waste is there it's most of the time reusable as i said uh, it's a high lead time Uh, due to complex tool design process uh, it's true for almost all of the injection molding or vacuum forming for casting it might be a little simpler but you still need to have a skill set to do that this manufacturing method can work for both plastic and metals it is kind of true because you cannot use any metal or plastic you have certain limitation but it work on most of the material that we use usually in engineering uh, designs it has certain design constraints such as draft angles spurs and wall thickness you cannot go to really really thin walls for most of the processes you have option of going for vacuum forming but it just make your process more expensive and more complex examples are casting injection molding vacuum forming the next manufacturing third is subtractive manufacturing which is uh, basically you have a cutting tool you start with a raw block of your raw material you start to cut the raw material from it and then you attain your final shape examples are cnc turning drilling lathe it is really good manufacturing method it is high accuracy with high accuracy with excellent surface finish but the problem is you need to know how to use cnc or lathe it's not easy to use you have to have skill set again as uh, which is same for uh, our format of manufacturing also you can use almost any materials such as metal plastic foam it requires a special cam tools to design tool path for complex design you cannot just start uh, the machine manually you have to have expensive computational power you have to have special software to design cam you have to design the tool path to work on a job 
it has expensive machines your cncs are typically very expensive and you just won't get access to those machines easily it is expensive if anything happens to machine it's much more expensive to repair the machines the tool access must be considered while you are designing the part this is really important you cannot just design any part and think cnc is kind of a thing where you can make most of the thing most of the designs you can manufacture most of the design but this is always not true you have to consider how you are going to approach to any part of your design how your tool is going to approach to any part of the design while you are designing otherwise you will end up with a design which you cannot see and see if you have a really complex part uh, you have to orient the part couple of times while you are doing the process which makes your lead time higher which makes the whole process complex which increase the part cost any of the subtractive manufacturings are considered wasteful processes because you are essentially starting with a big material block and just chopping off the material from it it ended up whatever waste or whatever material are you are removing it ended up most of the time not reusable you will just end up with a lot of waste so these are two major manufacturing methods uh, which are there in engineering domain there are some others but uh, they are not that common but uh, the next method that we will consider is additive manufacturing which is totally different from any traditional method it is also called 3d printing rapid prototyping these are some names and there could be some others also but uh, in additive manufacturing or in 3d printing you will add your part layer by layer one layer at a time the you can almost make any geometry with 3d printing it is super easy to do it is machines are almost inexpensive there are some machines which are expensive if you go for industrial scale but you can most of the machines are not that expensive as compared to your some other manufacturing machines it is really good to use 3d printing or rapid prototyping when you are on your prototyping scale or when you want to do really low volume production uh, i think somebody is asking a question okay we are, are going to discuss the question when uh, in at the end or whenever i'm st uh, stopping in between let's continue with the presentation right now uh, it has certain limitation the mechanical properties of your printed part are not going to be as good as your traditional manufacturing of formative or subtractive your mate whatever printed part that you will end up it is not going to have isotropic properties it is going to be an isotropic properties so what this essentially means is whatever part you are printing it's not going to have same mechanical properties in x y and z directions if you are printing in x y direction and if your bed is moving in z direction then you are going to have better properties in x y direction and less mechanical properties in z direction there are certain things that you can do to avoid that or you can design your part in a way that your z direction properties are not important or you can reorient it the part to comp uh, to compensate these things but that is going to uh, we are going to discuss that much later in this course there are certain limitations such as you need support material that could be wrapping there are uh, limitation on what part size you can make with this this kind of 3d printing or this kind of manufacturing is easily scalable there are printers which can print up to 6 to 8 inches mm -hmm. there are some printers which can print up to 40 to 60 inches also so it is super easy easily scalable there could be small parts which can fit on your hand there could be a giant part which won't even fit on your room and that is not something that is going to happen this is already happening in the world around us you have a lot of material option in 3d printing you can print with metal you can print with thermoplastic you can print with polymer there are photopolymers also the example different there are different processes there are different technologies in 3d printing such as fdm sla sls metal printing which we are going to discuss in detail next so uh if it is not clear what 3d printing is yet we are going to clear it now in the next slide say you have this cylinder 
now you want to slice this cylinder into small circles you can you can cut it into like really thin layers so whatever each layer is essentially a 2d circle what will happen if you like if you have a, a lot of cylinder you will stack up those if you have a lot of 2d uh, circles you will stack up those circles one on top of each other into z direction basically this is your slide cylinder if you stack those cylinder into z direction then you will end up with some design like this so you started with a 2d circle and you end up with a 3d cylinder this is how 3d printing actually works whatever design you have you will slice up that design into really thin layers you will make each of this layer you will make one layer at a time then you will add your next layer on top of the previous layer in that way you will end it up making layer on top of each other and then you will end it up with a whole part so this is a typical 3d printing this is a really simple example this is just to explain how you are making layer by layer manufacture how you are doing layer by layer manufacturing so uh next we will going to discuss some comparison of traditional manufacturing to 3d manufacture 3d printing as you can see all these three methods are making almost same design but with different uh, manufacturing it could be different as you can see first we are making this design by a formative manufacturing as you can see here we have a four part mold you have your part cavity inside the mold you are pouring your raw material here when you remove your mold part you will end up with your part essentially there is almost no material waste here as you can see most of the material is still there and you will only pour whatever material needed inside your mold cavity as you also can see you need to have this mold beforehand to make the part which makes this process expensive it is not uh complex it is not expensive for the in terms of raw material but when you consider the cost of the tool or the mold it become really expensive this next one is subtractive manufacturing where you have a raw material block you have a cutting tool also here you start chopping off material from this you move your tool in 2d and 3d you reorient the part you starts to cut it cut the material and then you will end up with this thing so you basically get easily like good material properties but you will end up with a lot of waste here if you can see from here to here the volume is reduced a lot and whatever volume is reduced that is essentially your waste and this is your additive manufacturing or 3d printing you there is no waste of material here there is no need of tool uh, what is needed in formative manufacturing you are just making your part layer by layer and you will end up with the material with almost no waste at all so this is the beauty of 3d printing you don't need any tool you don't uh, need any waste you will end up with some waste in terms of support material but this is almost negligible compared to other manufacturing and you will make your part with almost no extra cost and super easily with almost zero lead time so uh, i think i'm going to stop now and if anybody has any question they can ask it right now i think we have some questions here uh devet kulkarni is asking how likely metal 3d printing will replace vmc the casting process in industry or how advanced advanced the technology is okay so in terms of replacing cnc with 3d printing this is something that is not going to happen because cnc has certain advantages 3d printing has certain advantages so it's not going to replace completely see uh, the metal printing is not going to completely replace the cnc or casting but it's going to go side by side as the casting right now the parts are designed for 3d printing uh, but uh, when you are designing your parts for 3d printing it is going to be something diff uh, really different to what you are designing for the casting so uh 
okay suppose i have a design in cad yeah how can i 3d print and uh, how to give the input to 3d printer okay utkarsh uh, to answer your question uh, i'm going to discuss different 3d printing processes at the end and we can discuss how you can design like how you can go from your part to the 3d print how you can start from your part or your design in cad yeah and you will uh, how you will then give uh, input to the 3d printer uh, that's in the last slide and we will discuss that right now if anybody has any kind of confusion what printing is how how basically what 3d printing is if anybody has any kind of any kind of confusion in that uh, i think this is the time and you should ask this okay naman uh, to ask sir your question how do the layers merge since they are at molten won't they cause any deformities so they basically merge because your plastic is in semi molten state so when it solidify it will kind of join with each other it will not cause any kind of deformation but uh, as i said before there are some an isotropic properties so say if Uh, take an example of this particular object if this object is being printed in this direction which is z direction then there will be less mechanical properties in z direction because there are layers in z direction so if you pull this uh, part from in this direction then the layers are going to open up that's why the an isotropic properties for 3d printing cause a problem but this is only true if you are do, if you are using some like uh, simple 3d printing like fdm but if you go for industrial methods there are certain things that they have developed are the the way the 3d printing works uh, is the, the way that these tech, those technologies works is they will compensate for this kind of uh, deformation not for deformation they will compensate for this anisotropic properties by employing some other uh, methods over there okay so does anybody else has any question as of now or uh, whatever answers i gave for utkarsh and raman is that uh, good enough how much life does a 3d printed product last in terms of life of a 3d printed part it is same as what you have with any other manufacturing methods uh, if if it is whatever part you are designed if it is under the load that you designed for it will go for forever there is no life that it will just fall or it will just uh, deform it will it will last for for ever basically it will last for whatever design time you have designed it uh uh what are the raw materials used in 3d printing so uh, as we will discuss different 3d printing processes we can discuss what raw materials are being used because they are totally like different from each process to process and we are going to discuss material by for each process uh, in the next slides okay so i think we are going to continue now if you have any other questions we can answer that at the end or we will uh, make another uh, short break in between and then you can ask at that point okay so uh next i am going to discuss about cost comparison between this three major manufacturing processes here you can see this dark black line is for formative manufacturing this grayish line is for subtractive manufacturing and the red line is for additive manufacturing as you can see here the cost per part which is on the y direction and number of parts which is on x direction x axis you can see the cost per part for uh, formative manufacturing is really high which is because you have to make the tools you have to design the molds which is expensive but if you are making tens of thousand of parts then your mold 
your mold cost or your uh, casting pro your mold cost will basically will be divided onto tens of thousands of parts so your cost per part will go exponentially low as you increase your number of parts so this is really good method when you are doing uh, when you are doing a large volume production if say if you are making tens of thousands of pieces of something then definitely formative is a way to go but if you are in your early stages if you just want to prototype something then you cannot do formative manufacturing since the cost is really high if you go for subtractive manufacturing the cost will go down compared to your formative but it is still high it will go exp it will go exponentially low as you increase number of parts up to a certain point and then it will become almost constant or it will reduce but at a really low rate this is because in the starting you have to invest a lot in tooling you have to invest a lot in jigs you have to invest a lot in terms of manpower and computational power to design your cam tooling designs so as you can see the major disadvantages for both of these methods is in this particular area where you are in your prototyping stage you don't want large number of parts you just or you just want a small production run you want to have a customized design you want to have customized part then you cannot use this method because it is really expensive here the additive manufacturing comes into play because it has almost same price irrespective of how many parts you want to make so say if you want to make 10 parts then your price will be same as if you want to ten, make tens of thousand of parts so the cost per part for additive manufacturing is almost same it will reduce little bit when you increase the number of parts but it will go from 1000 to 980 970 but it won't go drastically low so this is kind of cost comparison for different uh, manufacturing methods which will clear uh, the there is some kind of confusion about 3d printing or mis i would say not confusion but misconception that 3d printing is really cheap it is not it is expensive but it is really cheap if you compare it to any other manufacturing method if you compare it to what kind of customization you can do you can make your parts in really really small or really almost with almost no lead time then you will definitely go for edit manufacturing or 3d printing okay so now we are going to discuss different 3D printing processes one by one. We are not going to go into too deep about these processes, but we are just going to discuss how the process works, what kind of material are there and what technologies are there for that particular process. So our first method is material extrusion. In material extrusion, you have molten thermoplastic, which is forced through a nozzle and deposited uh, onto a built platform in a predefined manner to form the layer and then to form the object layer by layer. Okay, so if you see this diagram, uh, like a layout over here on the right side of the PPT, here you have an extruder, here you have your build material and your support material spools you have uh, motors inside your extruder which is shown here you feed uh, your raw material or your build material and support material into the extruder this extruder is heated to a temperature where the this two materials will melt once these materials are melted then you will use these gears to push this material through the nozzle now when your extruder moves in x y direction uh, which is controlled by motors uh, once this extruder moves you it will form one layer once your layer is completed then you will move your platform into uh, z direction downwards and then again you will form the next layer on top of your previous layer in this way you will continue uh, to make your uh, part into the z direction this is uh, this particular uh, 3D printing process is also called fuse deposition modeling because you are essentially uh, depositing your material in a fused or in a melted format. This is also called FDM. 
this is most common method uh, right now most of the desktop uh, printers uh, or most of the 3d printing when you uh, when you get any kind of news or when you see any 3d printed product 90% of the time they are manufactured by fdm or fused deposition modeling it is uh, all the thermoplastics can be used in uh, fdm the typical material is pla and abs but you can use hips pe ultram ttu ptg pa you can even use hdb and pe also this kind of process is really easy scalable there are both desktop machines which will literally fit on your table next to your computer or next to your laptop and you can print parts easily onto that there are machines which are gigantic which are size uh, which are as big as the size of a room which will print parts which are up to 60 80 inches high and they definitely need some extra things on the machine but this particular process can be scalable to desktop or industrial scale so these are some example of uh, printed object uh, with a fdm printer some of them printed uh, in my company and others are just some photos so the next printing process is wet polymerization in this process a liquid uv sensitive polymer is selectively cured by a laser to form a layer so the layout for this process is here you have a build chamber you have a liquid photopolymer here you have a laser here uh, in the in the previous process our whole heating extruder is was moving in x in x and y direction but since you have a laser here you cannot just move the whole laser every time so you have a x y direction or x y scanning mirror here so instead of moving the whole laser system you will move your laser it this mirrors are also called galveno galveno meter mirrors this mirrors will move in a move on its axis x and y axis to direct your laser pointer into x y plane you will start your uh, printing the mirror will move it will form one layer once the layer is completed your build platform will move into either up direction or down direction based on uh, what kind of machine you have then you have a sweeper which will clean up uh, the tank and then you will have the next layer of your polymer your liquid polymer on top of your previously built layer you will make the next layer on top of your previous layer and then you will continue printing it uh interestingly enough this is the first 3d printing process which was patented around 1986 and the first commercial 3d printer was also a wet polymerization printer uh this printer came into the market around 1988 and ever since this method is keep growing and keep progressing right now this method has printers in bo on both desktop scale and industrial scale this is one of the most promising method right now the only problem with this particular method is since it needs a uv sensitive polymer it is kind of expensive and it is really messy because it involves liquid polymer which is not easy to handle uh based on how you are exposing or how you are making this layer this method could be a stereolithography which is also called sla or direct light processing which is called dlp so the difference between dlp and sla printer is kind of how you are exposing the photopolymer if you are using a single laser pointer then it is a sla but if you are doing the exposure for the whole film at the same time then it's a dlp printer we do not need to go in detail about uh, this processes in terms of material uh, you have different photo uh, different uv curable resins you know used for this particular printing Uh, based on how this uh, polymers are manufactured or by changing the chemical composition you can get different properties you have flexible resin you have a high temperature resin which has temperature resistance of up to 200 degrees celsius you have castable resin uh, you have uh, flex as you said you have flexible resin you have high detail resin which can print uh, with a detail of about 0.3 to 0.4 mm also these are some of the examples of uh, wet polymerization printing 
Okay, so before we go to the next slide, uh, is anyone has any question about these two methods as of now? Okay, if anybody has a question, uh, you can ask right now or I'm going to... Okay, does PLA means polyelectric acid? Uh, yes, Telshan, PLA means polyelectric acid. Can you please explain the formation of layer in wet, how the layers form in wet? Okay, so... Uh, okay, so... Uh, in wet polymerization, you have a photocurable resin. Photocurable resin means when this resin is exposed to uh, a particular wavelength of uh, light or laser, it will harden. Say if you have a uh, if you have a resin which has uh, which has curability uh, for red light source. Then when this, uh, when that particular resin is exposed to red light, it will become hard. It will become solidified. So in wet polymerization, you have a liquid polymer. But when this polymer was exposed to a laser point a source, which is coming uh, to a light source, which is coming from a laser from here and to reflect it through a mirror and come to the polymer, then after explosion, after the exp uh, explosion. Uh, after exposing that resin to the laser, the mirror will move in XY direction and your laser pointing will move also move in XY direction and it will cure the resin to form the layer. Uh, once you have the layer, you will move up your bed and then you will form your next layer again in the same way. Is that uh, clear up your doubts for Naman and for Ansari? Okay, in terms of slice thickness in FDM and in wet, it totally depends on what printer you're using. It typically ranges from 100 to 25 micron for wet polymerization and for FDM, it ranges from 100 to 300 or 400 microns. Uh, one my, uh, 100 microns means one mm, so you can say between 1.1 to 0.4 mm for FDM and between 0.1 to 0 0.025 mm for wet polymerization. Okay, uh, any other question as of now? Okay, so we are going to move to the next slide now. The next method that we are going to discuss is powder bed fusion. In powder bed fusion, uh, you have an energy uh, source in terms of laser and you will selectively fuse your form. You will selectively fuse your powder to form a layer. So a typical layout is here. It has again a laser or an energy source. You again have a mirror system to move your laser pointer. You have a powder uh, in a chamber. This chamber is completely filled with the powder. You will uh, expose, you will form a layer by exposing the powder through a laser. Uh, so what happened here is this laser pointer is will essentially melt up your melt your powder particles and once the particles are melted or they will melt then they will bind with each other and thus they form the object layer. Once you have your layer completed, then your build platform will move in downward direction you have your extra powder in another chamber and then you also have a powder deposition uh, slider kind of a slider or a roller kind of mechanism 
this roller will uh, deposit the next layer of powder on top of the previously uh, manufactured layer and then you will repeat the same process continuously uh, to form your object as you can see here the object is basically uh, essentially formed inside a powder chamber so you do not need any kind of support material since the powder will directly support your part but you also need to clean up the powder after the printing which is the reason most of this machines are on the industrial scale since this material particles are really small it is not suggestible to it's not uh, like safe to use this material without proper protection without proper gloves and uh, eye and ear respirators so that's why these machines are not possible to scale down to a desktop level uh, there are a couple of machines which came out uh, into the market in last couple of years which are kind of desktop printers but they are still not uh, up to a level where you can just put a SLA machine into your room and print something. So the material that you can use for this kind of processes are polyamide and composite polyamide in polymer. You can also use metal and metal composites for this. Based on how you are melting your powder or what your energy source is, this uh, technology could be selective laser sintering, direct metal sintering, selective laser melt, uh, melting or electron beam melting. The first method is selective laser sintering, which uses a laser and it is only it is only it only print things in polymer. The NAF3 uh, technologies works for metal. It directly use a metal powder and make your metal printing. So this is the technology which essentially print in metal. It doesn't print in metal, but it will print your part in metal powder. Okay, so uh, the next process that we are going to discuss is material jetting. In material jetting, your material is directly jetted into a build plate and then uh, that uh, material is cured by a UV light to form a layer. So in this technology, you have uh, your print head essentially here. You have your powder, you have your material uh, stored in this part, in this area over here in a in form of cartridges. You have print head which can deposit material droplets in a really small scale. You will deposit your material directly into a build plate form here. And once the material is deposited, you will scan, you will move the print head uh, to expose it to a UV light. Thus, your material is, your polymer uh, or your material droplets are cured by UV light and you'll form the, you'll form your uh, part here on the build plate form. Here are some examples of material jet, material jet printings. This method is really expensive. This is really expensive because you are essentially placing your material droplets directly onto a build platform. The material which is used for this particular methods are expensive as well as uh, the whole process. To control the whole process is expensive. The whole technology is also kind of complex so you cannot just scale it down. So it's on the industrial scale machines possible. The advantage for this printing is you can print two or three different uh, material, or you can change the composition of what kind of droplets you are putting on the build platform. And you will essentially end up with one part with, which has like three different properties at the same time. Say you have a shoe printed, it has like soft or rubber like sole. It has hard shell uh, around over here on the sides or on the surfaces. And it again has a soft uh, inside. For this, you have a transparent kind of skin and you have all your nerves and your brain cells, uh, your brain in the same model. So this technology is expensive, but it has super high resolution and it is really pretty models you can say can be printed with this method. So that's why this method is common in the medical industry, but it is one of the most expensive 3D printing. It has both uh, technologies, uh, sorry. It has both technologies of material jetting and drop on demand. 
The difference between this two is how you're putting the drops on the build platform. If you are putting the drops directly in a continuous form, then it's a material jetting. But if you're doing it one drop at a time, then it's a drop on demand printing. The next method is binder jetting. Binder jetting is essentially a combination of your material jetting and your powder bed fuser. It has same material chamber as what you have in uh, what you have in your powder bed fusion, but instead of selectively centering or fusing the powder bed, you will uh, you will uh, you will directly put a droplets of binder jet onto the powder. Which will fuse the binder, which will fuse the powder together to form the layer. Once you have the part printed out, sometimes it's needed some secondary step to uh, make the bonding between the particles more rigid or more uh, to bind them more uniformly. And since you are uh, since you are putting material uh, binder jet droplets on the material, it's also possible to. Uh, put droplets of uh, different coloring agents along with your binding agent. So this is it's also possible to print multicolor printing at the same time with this kind of method, this kind of uh, 3D printing processes. Uh, the material that can be used for minder jetting is sandstone, metal, silica, stand, and PA. The technologies that are that use the same principle are uh, color jet fusion, multi jet fusion, and binder jet. In color jet fusion, you are jetting your binder agent as well as your coloring agent, which will end it up with some colored print like this. In the other two, you will just uh, you will just basically uh, you will basically just jet the binder agent, so you will end up with a single color material like this. This kind of technology is also only on industrial scale as of now. Okay, so. If anybody has any questions, I think this is again a good time to ask it. Let's see if we have any question here. Okay, uh, does anybody has any, okay. How are movable parts like hinges printed? So you can print hinges also, it depends on how, you can print definitely on hinges on any of this uh, printing processes, but there are certain design constraints, there are certain design principles that you need to consider to design those principles. We do not have enough time to discuss all those in detail here, but if you continue with the course, uh, we are going to discuss design principle, design consideration for each of this many, each of this printing process in detail. And we are going to discuss all this thing, like how you can print hinges, how you can print an assembly, what kind of clearances are needed, what kind of tolerances are needed if you are printing different part and then if you're going to assemble those later. So that's going to be in the further classes for this particular course. Uh, among all these processes, which process is having more accuracy? So uh, in terms of accuracy, I would say SLA has more accuracy, but it's always not true. It totally depends on how, which part uh, you have and based on which kind of, based on your design, the accuracy will definitely change from part to part. So we are going to discuss and uh, we are going to discuss about accuracy of each processes later when we are going to discuss each process in detail. Naman has a question for a number of different material to be used in a single part, which type of jetting is to be used. So uh, to have different material at a single part, both material, uh, both uh, drop on demand and material jetting is possible. There are printers from different companies which either use DOD or material jetting and can print two material at the same time uh, in material jetting. 
Okay, we have one more question. Okay, so we have still a couple of more slides left. So I'm going to continue now with that. And then whatever questions you have, you can ask at the end. So uh, after binder jetting, the next two processes are direct energy deposition and sheet uh, lamination printing. These two processes are, are not that common and they are only on a limited scale. In direct energy deposition, uh, your material is welded while being deposited by use of a focused thermal energy beam. So basically, in simple words, you are doing a welding in a 3D space. You will deposit your material and at the same time by use of a really high energy beam, typically a laser or uh, typically a laser, you will fuse or weld that material. This printing is obviously only for metal as and you can imagine uh, energy needed to melt, a met to melt a metal is really high. You have to have a really high power energy source. That's why this kind of 3D printing is only on a limited scale as of now. And they're also on a research scale to make it more feasible for later on a practical uh, level uses. The next one is sheet lamination printing. In sheet lamination, you have a stack of paper or cardboard. You will cut out those things and you will have different like cutouts for different layers and then you will laminate all those layers on top of each other. This kind of 3D printing is only on a limited scale, uh, typically for some uh, display models, which are not too useful. But uh, this kind of printer are also there. This is kind of a wasteful process because you will end up with a lot of waste. Okay, so this is all the three different 3D printing processes possible. Now we are going to discuss steps in a typical 3D printing process and see how we go from a model to a 3D printer. Okay. So the first process in any 3D printing process is to model your part. This is basically same as your CAD modeling. This is exactly same as your CAD modeling. You will design your model into a CAD software. It could be any software. It could be SolidWorks. It could be Fusion. It could be Rhino. It could be 3D Max. It could be SketchUp. It could be Thinkercad. Some of this uh, softwares are typically for CAD mechanical designing. Some of them are for animation designing. Some of them are really like easy use uh, softwares like Tinkercad or Fusion, which are for more for people who doesn't know a lot about CAD and who just want to do it uh, through a website or uh, very on like on a very low level CAD modeling uh, skills. So uh, you will model your uh, part in any modeling software. Once you have your model ready, as you can imagine, different CAD software has different file formats. So you cannot just save your model in any file format and then print it. You have to have your CAD model in a STL file format. This is really important. If your file is not in a STL file format, then you cannot print anything. It has to be in a STL file format. There are some printers which can accept, <coughs> uh, sorry which can accept a model into a OBJ file format also. But uh, if it's not in OBJ, then, uh, but even if it's in an OBJ file format, then they, the software will directly convert it into STL and then will print it. Once you have your file ready, then you have, once you have your STL file ready, you can just save as your CAD file as STL also. Then you will import that STL file into a slicing software. For slicing, you can use NetFab, Simplify, Cura, Preform. Each printer has its own slicing software. So you cannot just slice your model in any, any slicer and then print it. It has to have a slicer which is compatible with the printer. Some slicers such as Simplify and NetFab are common. They can slice the, like they have the capability to choose the printer which you want to print and then they will slice the model based on your printer. There are also certain things that you need to do once you are slicing your STL file. Uh, 
there are uh, most of the time your uh, STL file has some triangulation issues. It's not uh, perfectly fine. Uh, basically, it needs some repair works. So you will also need to perform those repair works in order to uh, in order to slice it properly. Once you are done with this slicing, then you are almost done with your hard work. Now you just have to send your uh, slicing file, which is also called G code, to your printer. Once you send it to the printer, then you can just go to the printer, hit printing, and you will uh, your printer will start printing your object. The next thing is once your printing is done, you have to remove the support materials. It could be a manual work or it could, uh, it might need to done with certain chemicals. If you're doing a wet polymerization or if you're printing an SLA or DLP machine, then you might also need to do some cleaning with the uh, chemicals before you start to, before you use your, uh, before you use your printed model. Uh, once you're done with all your support removal cleaning then if you want to do any post processing if you want to do any painting assembly or sending then that's the last step and you have your printing done okay so if anybody has any question about it let's see mm -hmm. okay Uh, Santosh, is the melting point or other properties of metal limited the use of powder jetting process? Uh, it actually does because whatever powders used in a powder jetting, uh, for powder jetting you cannot use, uh, you cannot use uh, metal because uh, in powder jetting you will use uh, in powder uh, in powder bi binding process you will use metal powder but you cannot just use any metal powder it has to have certain properties uh, which which are needed to be satisfied and then only you can use the particular metal powder Okay, so uh, I think I'm done with all the PPDs. If anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, uh, we can ask now. Uh, yeah, Rajesh. So I think uh, we'll just uh, wait for a couple of minutes for people to ask a question. Yeah, okay. uh, this, uh, you'll be getting the recorded version of this seminar. Uh, we'll be sharing it with you all. So don't worry. Okay. And uh, yes, we do have another question. Yes. Uh, so all of you guys will be uh, provided with the participation uh, certificate as well for this workshop. So don't worry about that too. So thank you, Shrinik, for uh, spending some time. And uh, I think it's already late for you. It 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 should be over uh, 11 p.m. Right? For you? Uh, yeah, it's almost uh, 1 30 here, but uh, it's okay. We can wait for five more minutes and see if anybody has any questions. Yes. Sir. How much? Uh, Rajat is asking how much does it cost to make a 3D printer project at the college level? Uh, Rajat, you can definitely make a 3D printer for uh, your college project it's not going to cost that much uh, there are certain websites you can look over there you can find some cheap parts and then you can make it uh, i don't have any ballpark number but uh, you can definitely google a little bit and find some answers for that uh, difference between desktop and an industrial printer uh, pushottam the difference between a desktop and an industrial printer is 
a desktop printer is small in size it's typically 10 uh, typically 20 20 to 30 inches in height width and uh, length you can just put it on your desktop next to your computer or next to your laptop while an industrial printer is big in size it's typically six to seven feet in dimension uh, and in terms of build size also they're different a desktop printer has a typical build of eight by eight by eight while the industrial printers had a build of about 30 inches by 30 inches by 30 inches what determine the thickness of a layer while printing uh, it depends on your design what kind of detailing you have in your design what's the minimum feature size you have in your design it also depends on what kind of printing technology you are using so if you are using fdm then you can you cannot go below 100 micron settings for printing while if you are using any other uh, technology say wet polymerization or sla printing then you cannot go above 100 micron settings so it's it's a not uh, it's uh, in simple words it totally depends on your design and your printing process Can you determine the thickness of layer? Because as I said before, uh, the thickness of uh, thickness requirement for any kind of printing is dependent on your model. What kind of detailing you have? Uh, let's see. See if you are printing something like this. Mm, the skull on the center then you definitely need to go for really small really small layer thickness uh, typically 25 micron but if you are not printing on that much detail then the layer thickness would be 100 or 200 micron what's the basic required to start a 3d printing what are the basics required so uh, the basic requirement says you have to have a 3d printer you have to have a cad software uh, there are some free software that you can use to design your modeling once you have the model then and you have a printer then you don't need anything else what's the time taken to produce a 50 by 50 by 30 uh, can you give me the dimension for this 50 by 50 by 30? Is it in mm, is it in centimeters, or is it in inches? Okay, Naman, uh, motor for pushing the material is there. Uh, there's no other option. Uh, in actual FDM printers, there are not uh, directly motors which pushes the material. There are typically gears and those gears will push the uh, the motor is connected to those gears and those gears push the material through the uh, through the extruder again I'm to print something uh, of a 50 by 50 by 30 i would say the typical printing time would be somewhere around 12 to 24 hours The cost of a desktop printer, it totally depends on what kind of printer you want. If you want a cheap printer, you can get typically uh, in Indian currency about one to two lakh rupees. But if you want, uh, there are certain websites which will give you all the parts, which will give you detailed description about the parts and you can just make uh, the things. Okay, so uh, this is the last question after which we will be ending the seminar. Can a 3D printer material can uh, 3D printer material can replace metal part? Uh, yes, Rajat, the 3D printed uh, material can definitely replace a metal part. There are a lot of case studies available uh, on Google. You can search for those where 3D printed parts have replaced metal parts. There is a recent study in which G uh, G made a uh, made a 3D printed nozzle which uh, was which is used in a jet engine and it was replaced 
by their pre, uh, which the new part replaced their previous part. 